take a look at this scene because something special is happening here. It's the scrub room at a hospital in Prince George, British Columbia. All looks routine until you hear about the doctor scrubbing in. Are you guys ready for us to start? That's Dr. Nadine Caron, and she is Canada's first female indigenous surgeon. Can I have a flower, please? She's in constant demand at the hospital by her patients, at home by her 10-year-old daughter, <laughs> and at medical conferences across the country where she's trying to change the way we treat Indigenous people. The patient is the expert. Everything down to their cultural history and their cultural background and where they reflect from. Every day she sees the impact that racism has on her patients and on her as their doctor. Caron is also a professor at UBC. She often drops by the Museum of Anthropology. We talked about something that may make you wonder about your country and how we as Canadians see each other. Let's talk about being a surgeon, being a doctor. When did you first realize that that's what you wanted to do? You know what, it's, it's one of those things that it's the most bizarre story, but it comes down to an actual moment in time. It was back in 92, and uh, SFU, our basketball team, was an amazing team. We were down at national championships, and they, ma they made it so that all 16 teams that got to the national championships were assigned a corporate sponsor. Our corporate sponsor was HCA, our Hospital Corporation of America, and they offered the opportunity for us to come down to Jackson if there was any of us interested in the field of medicine. What were you wanting to be at that point? I was wanting to be a national champion <laughs> in basketball. But were you heading in a certain direction? You know, I had done kinesiology at SFU, so I was studying human physiology and human movement, and I loved it. So I got on a plane and went down to Jackson. My first night there, I arrived, they had this welcome barbecue for me and a whole bunch of of physicians were there and administrators and they introduced me to a physician a surgeon that said that he would take me on as a shadow for the summer and uh, I was there for about an hour at his house uh, for this welcome barbecue and his pager went off and so I said you know I'm here to follow you uh, I'd love to come so we're heading in this pickup truck down these dirt roads in, in Tennessee and uh, we head into the hospital and I see the ambulance pull in just as we pull in. Everything was happening in slow motion as I saw the chaos, but he seemed so calm in all of this. Um, we went to the operating room and on the way in, he was asking me questions. Have you ever uh, seen a lot of blood? And I was like, well, you know, I've cut myself a couple times. He's like, have you ever seen anyone die? Um, no. Uh, have you ever been in an operating room? No. The nurses just basically scrubbed for my hands for me to get me into a sterile gown and I stood at the operating table and uh, he asked me if I was ready um, and he started. He was so calm. He, he knew what he was doing. Uh, he was so focused. By the time we were finished it was about one o'clock in the morning and uh, I was covered in blood. I was just amazed at what I had just witnessed and I remember going into the bathroom and there was the old fashioned paper towel and I was rolling it down and I wrote my experience down on this piece of paper towel um, and uh, I it was this is what and it started off with I found it this is what I want to do and it was just moment in time you were hooked I was hooked what's I the love most it. challenging the most challenging um, getting I mean, from that point to this point I think what's hard is the emotional part of it it's um it's having that honor of asking questions to people who are scared, who are in pain, and they don't know you. And there's this, this need to find that level of trust uh, so that you can help them, but they can help you. All of a sudden, it's this instant team, um, and you both need to be in it all in. Stop that. Do you want to take that? And so you use it as a pen, like a pen, yeah. Thanks living up in Prince George, living in the north, uh, the demographics are very different than my training in the metropolitan centers. I did my education in Vancouver, San Francisco, Boston. Um, I'm in a different world. I'm in a place where the options that we see and the options we studied from textbooks and guidelines from national organizations, they're not always possible uh, for the people that you're talking to. 
And what do you mean by that? What I mean by that is, I think as, um, as um, a patient and a physician relationship, or a nurse, or a dentist, or a pharmacist, or a midwife, it's a, it's a relationship. And relationships are built on trust, and understanding, and respect. And I think that, and I, I've witnessed it, we fall short when it comes to understanding and respecting and honoring the culture of First Nations, Aboriginal patients in Canada. And it's based on, a lot of it's based on history. And so sometimes it's just the fear or the, um, the worry that if you do, as a First Nations individual, enter into the healthcare system at any point, whether it's for the screening or the ultimate treatment or the follow-up, um, are you going to run into issues with the lack of cultural competent care, culturally safe care? I'd like to now call on uh, Dr. Nani Kataron uh, to uh, give the next talk. As the healthcare provider, the person with the power, the person with the degrees and the initials after your name, you're learning from your patient. You're asking the questions because you have no idea where the abdominal pain is. You do not know how long that headache's been there, and you don't know what surgeries they've had in the past or what their allergies are. The patient is the expert. Everything down to their cultural history and their cultural background and where they reflect from. It's not just the skill of the knife or the scalpel. It's not just the, what you hear with a stethoscope. It's not just being able to read the x-ray or get a spec CT scan. It's pulling that all together so you can communicate that in a culturally safe environment so that anyone of any background feels comfortable coming in to your office, to your clinic, to your hospital, uh, and realizing they're going to be respected and acknowledged for what they bring to the table. One of the areas that you've been fairly outspoken on is the issue of racism within the healthcare system, which is a difficult discussion, um, and I'm sure at times a painful one for you, at times caught in the middle on this. Give me a sense of an example for you of how you've seen racism within the system when it comes to the patient care that's delivered for uh, First Nations or Indigenous peoples. An example, a patient walks into my office. She's a First Nations lady that's traveled the distance. And I walk in and um, she, I ask her what nation she's from, and she tells me, and uh, I explain, oh, you know, I'm Anishinaabe, I'm from the other end of Canada, um, and she starts to cry. She just breaks down crying. She's, I don't know, in her early 80s, and she says, I never thought I would ever, ever see and come to talk to an Indian doctor. Eight decades. She goes, you got to meet my grandkids. you, you got to talk to them. you got to come to my community. you got to tell them that this is possible. And you, so it's not, there, so there's that element of it where that you just see this relief, you know, sort of wash over her face. And what's it doing to you? It's amazing. It's an incredible honor. Um, it's an incredible responsibility. What is the r racism in that story? Is it simply that uh, this woman in her 80s had never been in a situation before where she was being dealt that's, with by an indigenous doctor. Yeah, and that's how it started. And then we started talking, and then I started realizing that a lot of the things that was on her sort of chart that had been sent to me by the referring physician, there was so much missing things that she hadn't done. And so she'd come to me for one reason, and we started talking about, okay, besides all that, you know, have you had a mammogram? because she, she, wouldn't, she didn't trust going into the medical system. But I had this opportunity to work with her to sort of say, okay, how can we take advantage of this safe space that we have right now to optimize the things that, that have sort of fallen off the wayside because of a level of distress, you know, a level of concern. Um, and you certainly see that. I still see it too much. I feel it too much, and I hear about it too much. Have you had the opposite 
example where a patient has come to you and when that patient recognized that you were First Nations, they said, you know, I'm not comfortable here. Yeah. You know what? I'm not, not that I'm aware of, you know, not that I'm aware of, um, but having said that, um, I don't share my background with someone who's not Indigenous because I don't think they'll care. I don't think they'll find that as Is a that positive thing. Is that why you thing. don't you don't share because well, uh, that point? Yeah, that I, it I don't think that wouldn't be I a positive thing. I don't think they'd find that a positive thing. Is that a pretty sad admission? I guess it is. When you wear your white coat or your physician, people don't say racist things up to, right to your face. When you have initials after your name, they they kind of they can't really say you know those stupid you know those stupid Indians, those First Nations, you know their graduation rate, they can't even get out of high school. They can't say that kind of stuff because I'm protected by these sort of Western measures of success. But I hear it, and I and I hear it enough because I have this honor of meeting on a daily basis new patients that come through the door and share their stories with me. What about your colleagues? What have you seen, not necessarily about you, but about the patients? As you're saying in Prince George, mm -hmm. where most of your work is, a lot of the patients are Indigenous, or mm -hmm. First Nations. Yeah. A lot of the surgeons, obviously, are not. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so what do you see from you know, them? Yeah. Um, there are a few examples that really hit home. I remember one in particular um, because it was, it was a fundamental learning experience for me very, very early on in, in my training. And when you're training, you're in so many different hospitals all over the country. And I was sitting in this um, lounge, a surgery lounge, and uh, a gentleman came in that was obviously a, a surgeon that had just finished a long case. He was sweaty, and, um, and I know the feeling. You can be pretty drained. Uh, and he sat down at our table, and he said, whew. You know, if I never operate on another Indian, it'll be too soon. And um, it was hard because it was awkward. Um, it hurt. I was angry, like this instantaneous, like gut or gut reaction to it. And um, so I, w I would say, my mom taught me: if you, if you ever feel that way, just count to ten. Don't say anything. Don't do anything. Um, and so at the end of it, I just sort of said, well, you know, if you don't want to operate on the Indian and get paid, then you certainly don't want to eat with an Indian for free. And I sort of packed up all my stuff, put it on my tray and, and walked away. And um, I didn't know what else to do, but I needed to get out of there. And I also needed him to hear that it wasn't all right and, and that, he, that, it, that it hurt and, and that it was wrong. Um, but it was odd because as I went on across the lounge, slowly, one by one, the other surgeons at the table that I was with, they packed up their stuff and they moved away too. It was, it was awkward. And um, eventually I looked over and he was sitting at this table by himself. And, uh, and then the next operation started. I had to go get ready and the day went on. And then it wasn't until much later, about four years later after that day, um, I, I, I was in a situation where I was seeing him quite frequently again, and uh, he came up to me and he said, you know, do you have time to talk? And I said, sure, and, and uh, I, did, I thought he was gonna talk about a, a clinical case or a referral or something, and he said, um, I, I, wanted, I, I wanted to apologize. And I was like, apologize for, for what? And uh, I was thinking, could he possibly be talking about this? Because I thought to him it was just another day and he said do you remember it and I said I, I remember it <laughs> I remember it and he said um, well I'm sorry and I said well what are you what are you sorry for are you sorry for hurting my feelings are you sorry like what are you sorry for and he said well that's just it Nadine he said I know that if I would have said sorry that day you never would have accepted it because 
it bigger than that and it's I've been thinking about it and ev throughout the years when I see a patient who's obviously Aboriginal now I catch myself I, I think about that day I think about that experience I think about what I said and I realized just how wrong it was and and my assumptions and the biases and the stereotypes and the racist way I thought to hear his apology so so honest and transparent and so genuine and and what I've said is I think that's the apology that Aboriginal people in Canada are waiting for. You know there are probably thousands of Canadians if not hundreds of thousands of Canadians um, who would like to fulfill what you just said and they probably don't know how they can do that. Hmm. You know, people argue, and you know, we've witnessed, I've witnessed it for longer and, and seen it, that exact kind of feeling that doctor had in the initial conversation. But I think we're living through a time now, I think, you know, people tell me that we are, where, where Canadians have realized a wrong was done they've listened to Truth and Reconciliation, they've listened to Murray Sinclair. Yeah. They're not sure what it is they're supposed to do. Yeah. You know what, I can, it's come up, it's come up in conversations that I've had, and I think it's having the courage to dive into the history of, of what our country is made of um, and, and looking at it differently. Um, and recognizing that that's who you are as Canadian and be proud of everything that's great about Canada um, and fix what's not. We're part of the Mangandodam. Yeah, you can say it really well. Wolf Clan. The wolf brings the spirit of the people together and teaches the importance of family and community. Be kind to your family. Always try to be thankful for them. I've witnessed firsthand how residential schools continue to impact the generations that follow. I, my daughter is 10. I asked her permission to tell this story. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> we were driving one day, and it was, she was four, and uh, it was in the springtime, and so it was just a couple months away from when she was starting kindergarten, and I'd actually even taken her to the school where she was going to be going to show her, you know, this is the school, this is the playground, and she was pretty pumped about that. And, and I'm driving her to her daycare one day, and I look in my rearview mirror, and she's sitting in the booster seat, and she's crying. Like, tears are just streaming down her face. So I don't know what's going on, so I pull over, and I'm like, hell yeah, like, what's, what's going on? And, we had just driven, driven by this, um, this development that oh, they cut down all the trees. Only one big, huge house on this development, and it was just dirt, surrounded by dirt. And uh, there's no siding on the house, and the, one of the windows was broken, so it was all boarded up. And, and she said, is that where I'm going to school? I said, no, you're not going to school there. I showed you the school you're going to, the school with the playground. And she goes, no. Oh, is that where I'm going? And I said, why, why would you think that? And she said, when you drop me off at school, are you, going to allow to, are you going to be allowed to pick me up? Are you going to be allowed to see me? And then I realized, you know, just sort of thinking about, she's heard about my mom's experience. She's overheard me talking to my mom. She's overheard the stories on the news. She's, she's Canadian. It was an eye-opener to me that I couldn't shelter her from this history, and nor should I. Right there, that answer and that answer. And, okay. Yes, good job, good job. The history of your family is, is fascinating in terms of the span of your mother, you, and now your daughter. Your mother went to residential school. 
she graduated yep. high school and residential school. Yep. She was the first on her reserve to do that. And the next first was you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yes. You begin your pathway. You go through high school. You go through university. You lost the basketball. But <laughs> can't win them all. You become the first um, female general surgeon in the uh, Aboriginal in the country. Now we look at your daughter who's ten. Yeah. What's the pathway for her? Hmm. You know what I. I think we're at a crossroads. I think that we have some uh, amazing choices to make as a country. Are we going to really grab them? We've got the hook in, are we gonna reel them in? So what's my daughter's path? She's proud. She's proud of her background. She doesn't understand why, and she has. There have been incidences already in her young life where She's been told quite clearly it's, it's not that great to be an Indian. She's been made fun of in terms of her background because she's proud of it, so she wears that on her sleeve. Um, but I love her response. Her response is that she just feels sorry for those people that don't understand how wonderful that history is. I think we have to start elevating our level of what we expect from ourselves as Canadians what we're going to tolerate and what we will no longer tolerate. Well, on that note, uh, I thank you so much. I mean, obviously we've talked about a lot more than just health care and surgery and the issues that are everyday ones for you. But a life concern of yours is one we've, we have talked about and I uh, feel richer for having had that opportunity. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.